So, is this, we good? Um, so thanks uh, so much, Vinny and the, uh, the team for putting this event on. Um, I want to talk uh, just for a few minutes about uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, the notion of storytelling. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting, and just for the record, just so we're clear, uh, when I say storytelling, I don't mean media companies producing content, and I don't mean exclusively ads. Uh, it means all storytelling. Uh, it means if you have a story to tell, you're included in that bucket, uh, regardless of what your intent is with that story. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I grew up uh, in the Bay Area, so just, out, just south of San Francisco, uh, in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, I was a paper boy for the Palo Alto Times Tribune. Uh, my house is 10 minutes from Facebook's campus, Google's campus, Yahoo's campus, 15 minutes from HP, 20 minutes from Apple. It is literally where the entire chip industry got started. Uh, it's not there anymore, obviously, just the, the, the digital tech companies are there now. But um, my dad, who's up there on the, uh, the top, I guess, left, uh, his name is Mark Simon. He was a reporter for a bunch of local papers. Uh, and eventually he went to go work for the San Francisco Chronicle, which is the uh, sort of the biggest uh, West Coast-based de facto source for news when it comes to tech. Uh, and he actually, before that, was a, a, a reporter for uh, the presidential election. So he went and met every presidential candidate from Jimmy Carter in 1976 all the way to Barack Obama in 2008. Uh, speaking of storytelling, come find me after. I will tell you some really funny stories about what is in the trunk of the Secret Service agents that protect the president, <laughs> kind of bananas. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that he was a traditional media storyteller covering a digital media world. Uh, and as those two things came together, uh, what's interesting is that the, the whole notion of an ads plus subscription print newspaper could no longer be a viable business to support the storytelling uh, that my dad did. Uh, he had a column that was 14 inches long, the entire side on the se and second section in the paper, where he got to write about whatever he wanted. Uh, he wrote about, um, did an interview with Steve Jobs and talked all about Apple just before Steve Jobs left. Uh, I got in trouble for trying to buy beer when I was 19 with a fake ID. He wrote a story about that. Uh, so he got to do whatever he wanted, and he was a phenomenal writer. Uh, but what happened over the sort of 30 years of his career in, 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 in newspapers was that the model didn't work anymore. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that it's not that he wasn't a good storyteller. It's that the business that supported the canvas through which he had to tell his story was no longer a business that could support this kind of storytelling. Uh, and so in, in preparation for this, I, I thought a bunch about that canvas uh, and, and where we are today relative to that canvas. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to be a storyteller, you had to be a writer. The only way of, of, of communicating your story was the written word, newspapers, books, magazines. And then Marconi invented the radio, and all of a sudden, the spoken word became a storytelling medium. Uh, and so the canvas became two canvases. There was writers, and there, was, there were storytellers. Uh, and then, uh, I didn't actually know this until I looked up this for the presentation, the television was invented in London. Uh, somebody invented the television, his name was Baird. Um, now it's sight, sound, and motion uh, that, can, that can tell stories, right? And so from you know, 1930 all the way up until present day, storytelling was done through sight, sound, and motion in that canvas, written word in that canvas, spoken word in that canvas. And then in the 90s, AOL and Yahoo put the internet to the masses. Uh, and what's really interesting is that the canvas shifted. Uh, it, and, and now you had this fourth thing that was digital. Uh, and digital was always, it still is pretty poorly defined. It's not like, hey, I have this many inches of newspaper to put a story into, and so now I'm good, right? Digital can be anything. Uh, and as we look at today, in fact, digital is all formats. On my flight out here, uh, I live in New York now, by the way, not here. Uh, also, caveat, I apologize if the references are American. Uh, I am an American, sorry. Uh, so um, on the flight out here, I read Esquire magazine on my iPad. I listened to the New York Times podcast called The Daily, which is a new version of digital radio. Uh, I watch Game of Thrones. I'm way behind. Please don't tell me anything about it. But I watch Game of Thrones uh, through HBO Go uh, on my iPad. Uh, and I watched uh, uh, this new original series from Amazon called Sneaky Pete, a digital uh, consumption pattern produced by a digital company. The fact is the canvas is now entirely digital. The way that storytelling happens, if there is a, an opportunity to deliver a story, pretty much guaranteed that story delivery will happen through a digital means. Uh, and so, 
um, as we think about uh, that, that digital means, um, one of the things that, that I find interesting is that today, right now, and actually every, every presenter has talked about this, this is what the canvas feels like. It's not digital. It's that we're consuming content on Facebook and, and through Facebook and Google, and potentially Snapchat and potentially Twitter, but time spent is being spent with those two big companies. Uh, and there are, there, there are those out there that would say that the canvas is locked around those guys and that we all, as storytellers, need to be good at telling stories inside those environments. Otherwise, we're toast. Um, I don't think the chessboard is locked. I think it's still super, super early in this game. And as storytellers, we all have the obligation to try and figure out how to get our stories everywhere. Um, I'll give you a few examples of why I think this. Uh, and by the way, 15 years from now, if it is just Facebook and YouTube, I think we'll have missed an opportunity and I'll look like an idiot. Uh, but the good news is that so will all of you. Uh, so we'll be together. Um, can we uh, play this video here? All right, so here we are in front of the uh, elephants. And the cool thing about these guys is, they, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts, and that's, that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. Does anybody know what this video is? It's been this first video, YouTube video ever. 44 million times this has been viewed. This has been consumed more than the entire body of work that my father, who was a reporter for 35 years, produced. Think about that. 35-year career, he has never had the reach as this stupid video. But the interesting thing to me is that this is what YouTube was in 2005. And we look at YouTube today. Um, I'll go through another video in just a second. Uh, but it's, it's totally fundamentally different. And the point is that as storytellers, this was not a good forum for storytelling. This looked ridiculous. Um, let's go to the next video and we'll talk about it after that. Allow me to introduce the rest of us. We're the makers, the directors, and, and the creators of this generation. We don't have big award shows or huge budgets or fancy cameras, but what we do have are our phones and duct tape and parking lots and guts. And we have ideas we need to share. We know it's not the size of the production that matters, it's what you make. We don't create because we have to, we create because we love to. And we've captured billions of moments from different angles, for different reasons, for millions of viewers but with one thing in common. When we're told that we can't, we all have the same answer. Watch me. So uh, Thank that's, you. that's Casey Neistat, uh, one of the most popular filmmakers on YouTube, has about 8 million followers, has a dozen videos that have been viewed over 20 million times. I highly encourage you guys to go watch the video of him snowboarding through the streets of New York City. It's hilarious. Um, but the interesting thing is, first of all, that was an ad. That was an ad that aired during the Oscars uh, to promote Samsung phones. And Samsung's trying to tap into the notion that creators need good devices and that your device can be your phone. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is that every single clip in there came from YouTube. Those were creators on YouTube. And what YouTube has done a good job of is creating a forum for that content to exist. Uh, but We've, we're just getting started. We're, we're in the very beginning of all sorts of uh, new screens coming online and becoming digital canvases for us to tell stories, whether that's ads or it's content. I'll give you an example uh, next of something that we've done at Oath uh, with a division called Riot. Uh, it's our AR VR 360 production group. Um, and, and to me, this is a really powerful example of, uh, the next slide, of, um, of uh, how you can be a storyteller with a totally new canvas a canvas that's just getting started. And this is a year into AR. This isn't 15 years into AR. This is just getting started. So let's, let's take a watch. All right, we're going on a field trip to a museum, and not just any museum, it's actually the most famous museum in the entire world. So has anyone been to a museum in another country before ever? 
Not even another state? Wow. Well, this is a treat. Uh, uh, just a tiny bit. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready to go to the museum? There was there was artwork just sitting here, hidden right before your eyes. Oh. Hey, you hold it. That's the magic. That's what you were expecting. Pull up this picture. So uh, the thing that stands out to me is how delighted those kids are. I mean, they're absolutely blown away. Uh, and this is, this, is the, this is the first iteration of an AR thing that we've done, right? So the, the, think of the, the thing that I get excited about is the number of, of uh, canvases that we're all going to have to tell our stories on. And not all of them are owned by Google and Facebook. Um, there are screens that are connected everywhere. And right now, the experiences for those feel awkward. They feel stupid. They feel lame. They feel like that first YouTube video that was posted. Uh, the, the videos you get served at a gas station while you're pumping gas are really horrible, right? There is a storyteller out there who needs to connect with people who are driving in the next minute or so. And they have a voice, and they have a point of view. And it's, and it's our jobs to make sure that that story can wind up on those screens. Uh, we're going to go through a few examples of of, of things that we look at that are really exciting for us as content consumption experiences. Uh, this is the new Samsung Smart Hub fridge that got released at CES this year. This is a giant screen. This is like four iPads, and it lives in your kitchen. Uh, imagine having the ability to tell a story as a brand about the high quality nutritional value of the food that is inside somebody's refrigerator. There is a chef out there right now that will be the Samsung Smart Hub uh, equivalent of a YouTube celebrity chef. Uh, and as storytellers, you have the opportunity to connect with those people too. Um, how many of you are familiar with this, with this ad campaign? I absolutely love this. This was a, a, a mall, I'm not going to say it because I'll say it wrong, but near London. Uh, this is a Westfield mall. This is, uh, they, they used uh, vehicle recognition to deliver custom creative to a, a digital out-of-home billboard. Uh, this could be an ad. It could also be breaking news. It could also be uh, a shopping experience. It could also be um, Nike talking about their line of, of smart products that are coming out that you can buy inside the mall. Uh, so all of these canvases that are digitally connected are an opportunity to tell the story. All right, you can play this video too, and we'll talk about it in a second. This year, you will have the opportunity to have content delivered to you based on what you're wearing. That's ridiculous. I mean, I, I didn't even know this was a thing 
until, we, and we, until my buddy told me about this. He bought, bought this Kevin Durant jersey that's connected. The next amazing big sports media reporter will have to think about delivering sports content inside this app that's owned by Nike. Uh, the ESPN anchor of tomorrow, that's his canvas, right? So as storytellers, as brands, as, as media companies, we should be thinking about this as one giant opportunity to tell stories in a new way. Um, I, I, I live in New York, like I said. The New York Times was like the pinnacle of journalistic uh, achievement. And so I grew up with this very high notion of the New York Times. So when I moved to the New York Times, I immediately subscribed to the paper. Um, I think they're doing an incredible job of tapping into, right now today, this new digital canvas. Um, I haven't picked up a print newspaper in a couple years. I have three small daughters. There is absolutely no time for me to read a newspaper. But I get the bulk of my news from the New York Times. I get it from the iPad app, which has digested down the amount of content they deliver to me to a small enough amount that I can get it in my 22-minute train ride. Uh, I listen to The Daily, which is a podcast they do that covers two, maybe one story every day. So they have a, an amazing podcast. This is the number one podcast if you, go, if you listen to it on Spotify in the US. Uh, they, just, they syndicate their content to portals like Yahoo. Uh, and finally, they have a, a, a desktop version of the newspaper, but it's enriched with all kinds of deep stories they couldn't afford to fit into the, the print newspaper, and it's got video that they've produced in-house. So they're doing a good job of tapping into all of these canvases, and what they're starting to see is that they're selling a ton of brand sponsorship inside the podcast. That is a medium for them, a digital canvas that did not exist six months ago for the New York Times, and it is the number one consumed podcast, news podcast in the US. Um, so the fundamental point I want to leave you guys with is that it's time to rethink our understanding of, this, of, this, of content creation and the digital landscape. Uh, you don't have to think about just producing content or producing ads that will be consumed in one of the four boxes that exist today. And the longer, you, the longer we all live in those four boxes, the more money Google and Facebook will make. The more money, the more market share, the more time and attention they will take. So instead of thinking about, okay, how can I make sure I get a ton of followers on YouTube, think about all the places that your, people, that your audiences spend time. Um, so uh, at Oath, um, what, what we're doing is uh, we're focusing on making sure we build the infrastructure to deliver those, those content experiences, deliver those stories. Uh, and for us, what that means is we've built a globally distributed content delivery network. Um, helps that we're owned by a big telco who has amazing competency in that sort of infrastructure. Uh, but we stream content to every device that is on the market that's capable of receiving content. Uh, we have integrations with 27 OTT uh, uh, app developers, or uh, app, um, <coughs> app systems. Uh, we have a full programmatic ad stack for every media type so that you can start making money if you're a media company out of this whole ecosystem. Uh, and then finally, we built a whole suite of services about moving content around. We've got 5,000 partners globally who take content from us one way or another. And the nice thing is, you know, you made the joke about a media or a tech company. We are a media company in that we own Huffington Post, AOL.com, Yahoo Sports, Rivals, amazing big scaled content brands. And it is critical for us to move our content into those environments. And while we're building that infrastructure for ourselves, we're building the tech to enable any other media company to do it, to do it, uh, to do it as well. So we are a media tech company. Um, final point, go tell your stories. That Samsung Smart Hub refrigerator, whoever figures out how to deliver cooking content and create content right there will have a big business. <laughs> and that can, be, that can be healthy living, right? The existing magazine that's the, under the Condé Nast umbrella. Or it can be anybody else. It could be a brand. Uh, so go tell your stories. We're here to help you deliver them. Thank you very much. Thank you.